Hi, I'm Mike from Craft Supplies USA, and today I've got a really exciting project for you. We'll be turning a succulent planter. The nice thing about these projects is it doesn't require a lot of expensive materials, and they're super easy to turn. The shapes and design are easily modeled after the pottery type bases you use, or you can use anything up to your imagination. The other nice thing is, is everybody you know is going to want one of these on their table. Let's get into the turning materials and show you how to make one. For the base we're going to be turning today, I'll be using a 3x6x6 piece of ash, and it's about 10% on the moisture content. The moisture on this project in particular isn't too crucial because you will be filling it with soil and it is going to be wet. I just want something that's dry enough that won't warp during the turning process or be prone to splitting. Um, this is just a piece of white ash. You can use really any material you'd like. And the great thing about this project in particular is you can change this depending on the type of succulents you want to put in it. So you can turn this for a single, like I'll be turning today, or you can turn the one like we had out of the cherry that had three different succulents. And it's really up to your design choice and, and what you want to put in it. So for this piece, again, it's just a three by six by six piece of ash. And then I've cut the corners off on the bandsaw for safety. So let's get this mounted on the lathe and we'll get our uh, eye protection. And if you're gonna be wearing a dust mask, go ahead and throw that on as well. I've got this piece drilled out and prepped for my three-in-one screw chuck. Um, this is a great way for mounting and turning bowls on the initial process. If you don't have one of these, you can go ahead and use your regular four jaw chuck with the woodworm screw. I'm gonna start the lathe and I'll hold this loosely in my hands. That way as it threads on and seats up, it'll take it out of my hands. If you're worried about doing that, you can obviously stop the lathe. And then we'll lock the spindle and go ahead and tighten this up and make sure we have a good bond with that chuck. Give it a quick spin and we'll set up our tool rest. For the initial process, I want to get this to round and then we'll start taking the corners off and getting that nice rounded semi-sphere shape that we've got. Also, we're going to want to bring up our tail stock for support right now. Anytime you can use your revolving center and your tail stock to support, Go ahead and do it. It just adds that extra layer of safety. And give that a quick spin. Just make sure that the blank isn't contacting the tool rest. Also, anytime I start up a new piece that's out of round, I always stand off to the side just in case. My hole isn't very secure. If it comes out, it's, gonna, it's not going to hit me in the face. So I'll bring this up to about 800 RPM. And you can see it's definitely out of round, so we're going to start roughing that out. All right, so I'll be using a half inch bowl gouge. So it's got a 5 8 bar with a half inch flute. Um, one thing I want to mention too is whenever I'm roughing pieces out, I'll usually sharpen my, uh, my tools with a coarser grinder. So this has gone with a 60 grit wheel. Um, anytime that you're roughing out, you don't need the really fine edge off a 180 or a 320. So um, this was just off, to, off a 60 grit. And then we can go ahead and start roughing this out. Whenever I get down to the edge of the material, I like to slow down and then just ease that cut in because I don't want to blow out all those unsupported fibers. And I'll rough this until it's just round. You can hear the sound it's making. We're getting closer to round. If I put the tool on the top, it's skipping just a little bit. So there's just one or two flat spots left. And now that we've removed the, the bulk of the outer round material, we can bump the speed up just a little bit. So I'm about a thousand RPM. Whenever I'm doing this, I kind of keep my first two fingers over the flute of the gouge to help block some of the shavings and direct them away from me. Again, slow down on those unsupported fibers. We'll stop this and take a look. I think there's just a couple flat spots, one right here and this bigger one right there. So we've got probably a quarter inch of material to go.
and slow down and ease those fibers off. I can feel just a little bit of flat spot still. Okay, we're right about there. I mean, there's just a teeny tiny flat spot and that'll be just fine because once we start rounding our shape over, that's gonna come out and then everywhere else is nice and trued up. So right now I'll adjust my tool rest so I can start going for the semi-sphere shape. And I'm gonna mark, I'll lose about an eighth of an inch to square up the base and then I'll rough my mark center just so I can see where that, I want that semi-sphere to meet in the middle. And then we can remove a lot of this material here. This is essentially a peel cut. I've got the flute in uh, about a nine o'clock position. If you need to, you can open it up to about 9.30. And then we're just easily gliding that into the wood, not getting too aggressive because we are turning dry ash here. So it is a fairly abrasive and hard wood to cut. We'll adjust our tool rest in just a touch now to give us full support that we need. And I'm going to true up the base. And I'm going to give myself a rough mark of where I want the exterior of the foot. And our jaws will probably open up to about right there. These are just rough outlines that way as I'm shaping I don't, I don't go past that point of no return to where then my foot's going to be too small or my chuck's not going to fit in the piece quite right. So it's nice to just kind of rough outline your, your shape as you're getting it. So. I'm gonna get rid of the tailstock now, slide that out of the way. I want to establish the recess for my chuck jaws and establish the foot, and then we can finish rough profiling the exterior and getting that bottom half of the curve just where we want it. For this piece in particular, I'll be using the VM120 with the two and a half inch dovetail jaws. And I want my recess to fit with these jaws being close to perfectly closed, because that'll give you a nice clean circle and you won't be engaging on just the corners of the jaws and marking the recess. So we're pretty close to our rough outline we had. I think that's gonna be maybe just a 16th oversized. So that's a good line we've got there for reference. And we'll cut the recess and we'll establish our foot and then we'll do some push cuts to clean up our outside uh, or exterior curve that we have. So let's get our tool rest where we need it. And just remove some of the material here. I'm also gonna bump my lathe speed up now that we have a lot of the bulk out of the way and it's running nice and true. So we're about 1400 RPM here. And I don't like doing really deep recesses for the chuck jaws. Obviously you can cut it about a half inch deep to fit the entire jaw, but I like to go about a quarter inch, you know, maybe three eighths. Is, that's as far as I'll go for my recess. I'm gonna move my tailstock completely out of the way. And I'll actually switch to a smaller bowl gouge and come from the center towards the outside. And then I'll flip that over and give myself the dovetail profile on the inside of the recess.
I just slipped off the cut there a little bit. I'm gonna go back and pick it up. And then as I get into that corner, I close the flute over so that I'm cutting just on the tip of the tool and I'm not engaging the side wing on the recess. I've got the handle swung out way from my body so it's a little hard to stabilize that. Um, it's something you gotta do a little practice with, find out what works for you. Start in the center again. If you, if you slip off the cut, just go back where it slipped off and pick it up again. Again, close that flute when you get down into the corner and we can take a look. Okay, I think I'll go to my spindle gouge just to clean up the corner of that a little bit. And then I have a teeny tiny little nub right in the center. Um, but let me show you real quick. So the nice thing about using the bowl gouge and going from the center towards the, uh, towards the recess there is you're cutting into end grain and it's a bevel riding cut. So it gets a nice clean surface finish. It feels like it's been sanded with 320. Very clean, no torn grain, especially on a piece like ash where it's really easy to tear out these open pores. So it cuts really clean, especially on the recess. Um, a lot of times when you're scraping into the recess, you'll tear out these end grain fibers and they're really hard to sand out. And most of the time, you really don't sand it out. So we'll scrape the nub away just a tiny bit. I'll get my spindle gouge because it's got a, a, a 35 degree bevel angle on it. It's a little bit steeper and I can get in there and cut that, that corner nice and crisp as well as flatten that nub out. To flatten the nub, I'm gonna use my skew as a negative rake scraper. I'm just gonna glide that back and forth across the center. Make sure that's gone so it sands out nice and flat. And then I've got my 3 h spindle gouge here. It's got a nice long bevel on it. We'll go into that corner and then we'll come from the center just to clean that up. It's hard to pick up on camera because I removed so little material in the corner. But now we have a nice clean shoulder with a slight dovetail profile to match our chuck jaws. And this should fit right in there. So if I close these all the way down, let's go ahead and check our fit. Okay, it fits in there nice. I'm going to open those up and just see what kind of gap we have in our chuck jaws. And it looks like it's about a sixteenth of an inch. So that's going to give us a really good hold as well as being close to a perfect circle, so we shouldn't be marking the inside of the recess. Now let's flatten the foot out and give that just a slight undercut there. That way we have a nice stable base for our succulents. I'm just gonna scrape that lightly to see how much material we have to remove. If your piece is really out of true and you've already sized the recess, um, you might be shortening up the recess too much, so you might have to deepen it a little bit later. But this piece is pretty flat. All right, and the pencil line I had was right about there for our foot diameter. So I'm gonna stop. Let's see what kind of surface that scrape left behind. That's pretty clean. So now we have our foot established. We've got our recess established. Now we can do some push cuts around the outside of the curve and get this cleaned up as well as try and leave a really nice surface to minimize our sanding time. I'll adjust the tool rest to where I can make, try and make that entire curve all in one pass while being supported on the rest. And one thing I've found as well is this one's got a really tight radius to it, so we might have to do this in two parts. Um, but it's nice to do a bevel riding cut as much as you can. So this is going to be essentially a push cut. We'll be on the bevel. Get my hands up on top of the tool. And just guide this all the way around. Getting a little bit of bevel bounce. I'm pushing too hard. I'm sure you can pick that up in the sound. Um, but you can see it's almost left a burnished surface behind. There's, there's no torn grain. Our curve's a little smoother. 
We have some more material, material here we need to remove, so I'm going to start the cut just a little bit further back. That's one thing with ash and a lot of materials is if you push the bevel too hard into the wood, it pushes back and then you get this oscillating pattern, a wave pattern on the exterior. So I want to make sure I'm pushing down into my tool rest and not into the workpiece. Start a little further back. Pushing just a little bit too hard, you can hear that, that bounce. Okay, I'm happy with that curve. Let's take a look at our surface. Surface is looking really nice. It's got a glossy look to it because it's being burnished basically by the tool. All right, I'm going to go ahead and rotate my tool rest around and pick that cut back up a little bit further on the piece. Perfect. If you don't want to do a push cut on a piece like this, you can definitely shear scrape it. So I'm going to switch to another half inch bowl gouge, but on this one I've ground basically an Ellsworth grind or an Irish grind, so it's got really long wings. And what you'll do is you'll drop the tool rest. And then as you're working, we'll drop the handle really low, down below our normal working height. And then we'll rotate the flute over to where we're cutting on that wing and it'll give us a nice slicing cut. And then you can just work your curve around. It's a little more controllable than the push cut if you haven't practiced it. And it's giving you a nice slicing cut. You can see the good curls we're getting. And we can take a look at the surface and see the difference between the, the shear scrape and the bevel riding push cut. So we don't have the burnishing super smooth surface, but it's got a good clean, um, it's removed all the tear out we had and it's a good surface. And you could, you know, honestly start sanding that with 220. So um, you can either push cut that, ride that around. It's a little bit trickier, especially when you're trying to focus on the curve you're getting, or you can do a shear scrape. It's a little bit easier. Um, play around with both different methods and give those a shot. So now that I've got my curve down here established, I think I'm going to take a little bit more out of this because I want to shift that center of our arc over just a little bit. One other thing to mention too is when you're shear scraping, I'll usually bump the speed up by a couple hundred RPM or more. If you're getting too far over the headstock end, just switch the tool to your other side of your body. This way I can watch the horizon and see how that shape is coming out. The only downside to shear scraping is the tool dulls pretty quickly, so I'm going to go ahead and sharpen this and I'll be right back. Alright, so I've just come back from the grinder, got myself a nice fresh edge. I'll do one more pass on this bottom half up to the burnished line you can see, and that'll be basically done and ready to sand. And I can feel right there, that's about as far as I can go over. So I'm going to switch the tool to my left hand side. Okay. Let's take a look at that surface and see what a shear scrape did for us. So there's absolutely zero tear out, nice clean surface. 
a little bit easier to control. Um, on ash, push cuts are a little tricky because it's really prone to that, that bounce you get in the wave. Um, but now that we have this bottom half established, I'm gonna rough profile the top half and get that into a rough semicircle um, and get that shape as, as close to as established as we can. So I'm gonna rotate my tool rest over and I'll bring it back up to regular working height because I'll be doing some peel cuts to true up the face here and then we'll start working this direction and get our shape. Might even be able to get a push cut from this direction. Okay, I'm liking the shape we're getting. Switch tools, sides of your body. Okay, I like that form we're getting. I'm gonna drop the tool rest back down now that I have that kind of rough profiled. We'll finish shear scraping across the center. Okay, I'm liking that form. I think I'll close that over just a bit more. So I'm gonna do a push cut from this direction. And then I'm actually gonna shear scrape from this side so I don't blow out the fibers. The other nice thing too is when I switch tool directions and now I'm coming towards me, now I'm cutting on the right wing which has that still fresh edge. Again, you drop your tool handle lower and your tool rest. That way the tools come in pretty steep, but then it's just gliding the wood off the piece and into the flute. Switch sides, come at it from this direction because there's a little bit of a flat spot right in the middle. Switch sides. Now I'm just trying to match those up and even them out. Okay. Now that we have our exterior curve where we want it, and we have our foot established and the recess cut and everything's ready, now we can go ahead and power sand, and then we'll flip it around and turn the inside of the bowl. Whenever you're power sanding, get your tool rest out of the way, that way you don't catch it on anything. I'm gonna turn our lathe back on, and we'll bring our speed down a lot. We'll go about 600, 700 RPM. Um, that's one of the biggest um, issues we see with customers is they'll power sand at too high of an RPM and their disc holders will start melting, the Velcro gets messed up. Uh, it's just too much heat for the discs as well as the wood. You can heat check your piece as well. So I'll start sanding with 220. Reason I'll start with 220 is I think the surface is pretty good. But if I have, it, but if I start with 180 and the surface doesn't need it, I'm just adding 180 grit scratches on the piece that I'm going to have to sand out later. So I usually start a little bit finer than I'll probably will end up using, but I just like to see if it's cutting enough and cutting efficiently. And if it's not, then I'll drop down a grit and see, see from there. Obviously, anytime you're sanding, use a dust mask, but for the video's sake and you guys, I'm not gonna use one. When you're, when you're power sanding a piece like this as well, I wanna maintain movement across the surface. That way I don't create flat spots in our curve. 
Just try and blend the curves that you have. And I don't want to sand across the foot yet. I want to sand up to it so I have a nice crisp transition where the pencil line is. And we can stop and take a look and see if that 220 is cutting what we need to. And it looks like it is. I'm able to refine the curve. It's not taking too long and I'm not adding those really coarse 180 grit or 120 grit scratches. Use that sandpaper to refine your curve. Fortunately, with the push cut and the shear scrapes we had, there's not a lot of sanding work to be done. I'm really happy with the curve that we have, and you can see we don't have any torn grain, which is key. A lot of times guys will try to start sanding when they have a bunch of tear out, and you're gonna have to drop down into your 80 and your 120, 120 grit papers, and it just adds a ton of scratches, and it just adds more time as well. So let's go ahead and sand the foot, and we'll sand the inside of the recess, and we'll grab some, some paper to try and just touch up the inside of that recess as well. I'm being very gentle with the pressure I put on this. I don't need to put a ton of pressure into it, otherwise I'm gonna soften that detail line I've got there between the foot and the transition there. And I don't wanna radius over my, my, the recess I have for my chuck as well. So just light pressure. I don't wanna see the pad squishing down a ton, just enough to see that it's moving and then being and abrading the work. Okay, I'll go to some paper now. Just fold that over and try and get in the corner. Just refine that surface a little bit more. It's got a really clean surface off the tool. There's a bevel writing cut. Stop the piece and take a look. Okay, the bottom looks really good. I think I'll sand just a little bit more here in the center and then we can go up to our 320. One of the common problems I see when people sand ash is they over sand it and because you have hard and soft areas in the piece, it gets wavy because you're taking a lot of the soft material away while the hard material stays there and then it gets really out around and, and bumpy feeling. So you want to be nice and gentle and try to be even with the pressure you have on your pad when you're sanding, especially a piece like ash. And this piece is kind of cool too. We have a lot of dark streaking on one side, a nice light area and some more dark streaking on this side. So once we put a finish on this, I think this will look pretty nice. All right, I'll sand up to 600, four or 600. All right, let's stop the lid and take a look. You can see we've got a really good surface on here. There's actually some figure in the piece now as well. And the foot and recess look good. So we can go ahead and throw on our scratch free and that's the only finish I'm gonna be using on this piece. I don't wanna use any sealers or any toxic chemicals because I don't want it to leach into my plants and kill the plants. So I'm gonna stick with food safe, basically just mineral oil and waxes is what I'll put on the outside of this, as well as I wanna keep the pores of the wood open for allowing ventilation to the root system and drainage if necessary. I've got my scratch free and I'll bump up my lathe speed again, about 1400 RPM. and then buff this into the workpiece. The nice thing about the scratch freeze because it has a, a light grit in it, it'll refine the work surface even more. And the grit itself breaks down and gets a little bit finer as it tumbles across the workpiece. The other added benefit is it won't discolor the workpiece from the chuck jaws because now I've got wax in there sealing the grain. You wanna be pretty careful with your fingertips in here. Ash being so open poured, you're really easy or really likely to snag your fingernails on a little piece of end grain there, so be careful. You don't want a sliver in your fingernail or rip your fingernail off, so just be careful and try and use the rag to get into those corners. I'll get a clean piece of rag and just buff off any excess wax we have on the exterior. We can stop the lid and see how the piece looks. 
So you can see that brought out a ton of the natural color. It's a good close to the wood finish, as well as being food safe and it won't affect the plants. There's actually some good figure down in the bottom there as well. Let's go ahead and unscrew this. We can mount our four jaw chuck and then we can turn out the bowl and then this project will be done. Unscrew that and just <laughs> sit that up on top of your headstock. You can take a look at the shape you've got. Um, this would be a good time too if you put this up here and you didn't like your shape, you can throw it right back on your screw chuck and it'll run pretty true. So I like the shape of that, especially once we get that open with a pretty little succulent in there, that's gonna be a nice tabletop decoration. Thread on your chuck. Again, this is a two and a half inch dovetail set. Mount that into your recess. And then I always try to push right from the center as I'm tightening my chuck key and expanding that into the recess to make sure it's seated properly. And then go ahead and tighten up both the pinion gears. So the piece is running pretty true. I'm happy with that. The nice thing too is the way we had that recess sized for the chuck jaws is it's not going to leave any marks on the inside as well as that wax is going to help prevent any of that paint coming off the jaws and sticking to the piece. I'll bring my tool rest, set that back up for our standard working height. Because I'm using that 5 8 bar half inch bowl gouge there, I need to be just below center a little bit that way my cutting edge is right on center. You can always grab your tool and just double check. We're going to be right there, that's perfect. I'm gonna center up my tool rest. This is one little tip and technique a lot of people don't talk about. You want your tool to be as close to the center of the tool rest as possible. That gives you less chatter and flex in the tool rest, as well as if you have a catch, you're not all the way over here on the end creating levers that could snap off your tool rest, if that happens. So usually I try to center that up to where I'm working within the, the center third of my tool rest. This being a 12 inch, there's a four inch range where you're gonna have the most support and less flex. Give that a quick spin. We'll be using uh, basically a peel cut here just to true up the face. I want to be careful to not cut too much off because I have a sanded and finished surface here and it's established as my height. As a, you know, if I start reducing the overall height of this piece, then my curvature changes and the shape you kind of lose. So I want to keep and maintain as much of that as possible there. Grab my pencil and mark out the rim diameter that I'd like. Just taking a look at the proportions and seeing if a 3 8 rim will look okay or a little too thin or heavy. I think that'll be okay. I don't want to go super thin on this piece because it will have moisture in it from the plants. I don't want to cause any cracking issues, so I want to try and maintain a, you know, a fairly decent wall thickness as well. We can start roughing out the center of the bowl now. Make sure your flute's closed when you start. And once you're on your bevel, you can open up the flute and ride that to the center. Um, a quick tip you can do is if you have a big two and a half inch drill bit, you could just drill out the center of that and then finish turning the, um, the bulk of the shape on the inside. Um, but a four and a bit's a really quick way to get, get rid of a lot of material right in the center. I can feel my tool is not cutting very efficiently anymore. I'm gonna to go touch it up on the grinder. All right, so now I have a fresh edge on the tool. Definitely takes less pressure to cut.
I'm sure you guys can see the swing in the arc of my tool handle. Once I'm on my bevel, I open up the flute a little bit and then I drop it and swing it and then I raise that back towards center. Having that arcing path in the cut makes it a little bit easier and takes less pressure off the wood and just cuts more efficiently as well. I'll stop and check my depth, just make sure I'm not going too far. Probably got another inch of material to get to the bottom. Yep, I want to stop about right here. That way I've got um, enough wall thickness in the base. And also that way I don't go through to my chuck jaws. It's a weird ticking noise. I had a shaving stuck between the bevel of my tool. So I've got the rim diameter established. I think I'll probably roll that over towards the center um, once we get our final interior passes done. Uh, for now, we'll just keep removing the, the bulk of the material down in the bottom. I'm going to stop the lathe and check our depth one more time. Okay, we've got another half inch or so of material we can remove. One other thing you can do right now is because that curve is really, really tight to get in there and still be a bevel riding cut, is you can switch to a heavy scraper like this. This is a 3 8 cross section scraper and it's got a French curve profile on it. And this is not a negative rake, it's just a standard grind scraper. This is a good, good way to get in there and get that curvature to match the exterior curve while still being um, controllable. The other nice thing is too is because the cross section, it's very stable. Just make sure you have your arm on top of the tool in case it does dig in or bite. Um, and also because the grain orientation is the same as a bowl, we're cutting into side grain here, not end grain. Let's stop and check our depth, feel the wall thickness and see what we've got working here. So by the sound you can tell it's about the same thickness all the way through to about here. And then it thickens up, we've got a 3 eighths or so material in the bottom to remove. 
And before I do that, I want to smooth out my curve right here on the rim where it's a little thin before I get rid of all the stability in the base. Getting a little grabby now that we're getting farther over the rest. Stop and feel our curve. The nice thing too is that scraper leaves a pretty good surface behind considering the material, uh, but because you're, you're cutting into side grain, cuts really clean. A couple ridges in there and I think there's still some more mass I want to take out of the bottom. I do want this to be a little bit heavier in the base than a regular salad bowl. Salad bowls you tend to want to have an even wall thickness all the way through and have them feel really light. This I still want to keep a fair amount of weight in the bottom just so it's not so prone to tipping over. Try and get rid of the shavings out of there so I can see what I'm working with. The nice thing about this French curve as well is because it has such an interesting radius to it, you're never contacting too much of the cutting edge at one time. Traditional round nose scrapers, as soon as you make that sweep and you hit the bottom, you almost engage about a third of the cutting edge and it starts digging in. So this is about an eighth of an inch wide cutting surface the whole time I'm making that radius. Just try and get a nice smooth flowy curve on the inside. And we can stop the lathe and take a look. Okay, I'm happy with that. It's definitely thicker than a regular salad bowl would be, but obviously we just talked about why. There's still plenty of internal volume for the root system and the dirt and soil we need in there, and I'm happy with that curve. I think there's just a little bit of a nub in the bottom. I'll smooth out, and then we'll finish up our rim here on the top. You just try and feather that out. If you have any ridges, any bumps in the bottom, start in one area and just try and feather that out and smooth out the curve until you're happy with the shape. Let's get my tool rest out of the way so you can see what we have. There's a little bit of torn grain just in the bottom, but the side grain here or the end grain around these edges is nice and, and cut very well. So let's finalize our rim and then we can talk more about the inside of the piece. I'm going to go back to my bowl gouge and shear scrape the rim. So I'll drop my tool rest down just a hair. And same thing, flute closed. I'm just going to roll that over and give it a slight radius. Now we can take a look and see how that looks. Okay, it's cut clean. We've got a nice transition between the exterior curve and the rim, and we have a nice transition to the inside of the bowl. So for here, from this point on, we'll sand the rim, and if you want to, you can sand the inside of the bowl. I'm not going to, because you're gonna be throwing soil in there and plants, and the inside isn't ever gonna be seen or used, and you know, people aren't gonna be touching it. 
I will throw some scratch free on the inside just to help um, support the wood fibers and seal those up a little bit. Just help prevent any rot or anything going on with the wood fibers once people are using it. So I'll get my drill back out. And I'll start sanding with the 320 because that rim's cut really cleanly. Again, we dropped our lathe speed back down to about 6-700 RPM. And then just glide that across the surface. As I'm working with the sander, I want to make sure to maintain contact just on the rim. And I don't want to roll this over and soften up that crisp edge we have on the rim. We can go back to our scratch free. We'll bump up our speed. I'll just throw one more coat on the outside. And then I'll throw a coat on the inside. Fortunately, the scraper cut so clean, there's no torn fiber and it doesn't look bad, but it's not perfectly sanded like the exterior, but I'm not concerned with that at all. If I had tear out on the inside, I'd probably cut it cleaner or I'd sand it out. I don't want to leave torn grain in there. That way when people are replanting and they're pulling the, the succulents out, you don't want to have a really torn up inside surface. So that looks nice and sharp. Let's go ahead and take this out of the chuck now. So you can see our recess is still nice and clean. There's no chuck jaw marks. The outside's turned really well and the inside's got a nice bowl shape for the succulents to fit into. We have got a really good clean transition and a nice curve on the exterior. So let's get our succulents out. We'll go ahead and plant one in here and we'll show you guys this thing when it's all finished. Now that our piece is turned, we can go ahead and plant our succulent. I have my plant selected and I've got my supplies ready. So I've got my decorative rock that'll go around the outside of the plant. I've got my potting soil specifically for succulents. And then I've got a little piece of plastic bag that I'm gonna put on the inside to help prevent any excess moisture from um, discoloring or staining the wood. First thing we wanna do is put this in place. So I'll tuck that down into the bowl shape and pour just a little bit of soil in there. Help keep that in place. And then I'll fold in any excess plastic you've got or you can cut it off with some scissors. You just don't want to be able to see that when the succulent's in the planter. Level out your soil. Pull that out of the pot. Go ahead and tuck that down and get that as centered as possible. Make sure your plastic bag's tucked down just below the rim slightly. And then we can add some more soil. This is a little messy, but no big deal. Okay, I think we're good on the soil. Just get that cleaned off. Now we can put our decorative rock in place. Take a look around and see if it settles. See if you need to add some more rock. I think that looks pretty good. Now I can set my soil and rocks off to the side now that I have those right where I want them. I'll grab, grab just a clean rag and wipe off any soil on the outside of the piece and that is a nice pretty little succulent base there's a couple considerations when you're doing the base if you want to add a drain hole at the very bottom you can just drill that out after you turn it that way if you overwater it it's not going to start molding the inside of the soil or the plant uh, but the biggest thing is just paying attention to how much you water it 
So look up some gardening tips on those to get a little more in-depth detail on how to plant and take care of a succulent. But for this project, I think we're done and I'm gonna go throw this on my desk.